I've been dying to tell this story that happened to me in the middle of August of this year, when I was startled awake from a sound sleep to someone standing in my bedroom by the window, staring at me. I've never doubted the paranormal or supernatural. I believe undoubtedly in the existence of ghosts, spirits, spectres, apparitions, whatever you want to call them, and poltergeist activity, although many videos on YouTube and paranormal shows on TV don't convince me because they're obviously fake and for entertainment purposes. There are a couple of exceptions, of course, but most, you've got to admit that the most terrifying thing about them is that someone posted them. Again, there are a few exceptions that have convinced me of something happens. I've used a Ouija board by myself and even collected vintage boards. But that is another story. I've used automatic writing, study astrology, tarot, geomancy, necromancy, runes, playing cards, aka cartomancy, and dabbled in palmistry. I've seen ghosts, not see-through apparitions, but solid individuals in broad daylight. One was a friend whom I hadn't seen in a while, whom I saw walking in town. I called to her and she kept walking, thinking she may not have heard me, and it was unlike her to ignore people. I finally weighed my way close enough. She stopped and turned, and her eyes were black. I thought I was seeing things and followed her into a store and couldn't find her. I saw a mutual friend who knew both of us and asked if she'd seen her, and she'd told me no one has been in the store in the previous half hour. I was confused. I know I saw her, and to some it may sound like she was avoiding me, but it wasn't like that. Puzzled, I went home and saw the local paper. That very friend's obituary was in there. She committed suicide two weeks prior by overdosing on pills. I believe seeing ghosts is a personal thing. The mutual friend didn't see her entering the store, but I saw her plain as day. Must have looked like a fool shouting her name in public. But you want to hear or read about my experience with the Shadow Man. Shadow people? I had trouble believing in them. I thought they were urban legends like Slender Man, Bloody Mary and Zozo. Videos claiming to catch them always were lacking. I went to bed as usual on that night in mid-August. The night was perfect, not hot and not cool. Great sleeping weather. Nothing was happening that I was interested in doing. So I decided to go to bed and do a bit of reading until I was tired enough to fall asleep. That was at 11 and I finally got tired at 12.30 and drifted off to sleep. Suddenly, I was startled awake from a sound sleep. I mean, wide awake. I could move all appendages so it wasn't sleep paralysis. I think it was close to 3am or thereabouts. The street lamp and moon shone through my bedroom window. That never bothered me as I could sleep with the lights on or off, and have, but I noticed a figure, or rather a silhouette of a figure, standing inside my window. I was convinced it was a break-in, and laid quietly, waiting for him to make his move, but he never did. He was around 6'2", tall and broad-chested. I mean, he was big, and just staring at me, never moving. I won't deny that I was scared thinking this guy was going to bash my brains or suffocate me, but that didn't happen. As I was watching him, trying to figure out how that big guy got in my window without being stuck, he started to fade away until he wasn't there anymore. I laid there for a few minutes longer, thinking if I got out of bed, he'd reappear. After what seemed like forever, I jumped out of bed and turned on the light. I examined the window and found nothing unusual such as being smashed or even open. It was how I had left it. You would probably think that I wouldn't go back to sleep after that. I did, but with the lights on. To be honest, I was relieved that it was a shadow person rather than someone breaking into my house. The guy faded out of existence, I think. The thought crossed my mind, he just went invisible to catch me as I got out of bed to turn on the light. But I haven't had a second encounter with any shadow people as of right now. Unfortunately, 
I can't prove any of this because I didn't have my phone on me or near me because it was in another room charging. I spent a lot of time thinking about this encounter. I'm just glad it didn't result in my hospitalization or burial. I have a story to tell. A real situation that to this day, I cannot explain. When I was about 14, I was doing the dishes at my mum's house. She had gone out for the night and it was about 8 p.m. Suddenly, everything went deathly quiet, but there was like a weight to it. I can't explain. Almost like the pressure in the room had changed. It felt really cold and then Something breathed out hard in my right ear. It was as though someone had come up behind me and had done a death rattle right in my ear and their breath was icy cold. I spun around and started sobbing. I was so scared. There was nothing there, but I was so terrified that I had to call my uncle to come search the house and stay with me till I fell asleep. To this day, I don't understand what happened. I don't believe in ghosts at all. But I'm so confused by what happened to me that it seems the only explanation. I sometimes settle with the idea that maybe I was hallucinating, but I was fully awake and didn't struggle with mental health issues at the time. There was also a very strange thing that I discovered in the wall of that house shortly after that incident. A large clump of dark hair embedded into the plaster of the upstairs storage room wall. Since that day, Everything changed for me. Like, I became a very different person. Very spontaneous and angry and hypersexual. Yet at times so sensitive and avoidant. Like I'm two different people at times. Even my friends tell me that I seem so different from one day to the next. Well, the incident was a long time ago. So maybe that's just my personality. But I used to be so different before then. I was sporty, quiet... I read a lot and I was extremely shy around boys. I don't know, maybe I lost my mind. But whenever I'm upset or confused by my spontaneous and outlandish behavior, my mind starts talking to me in the third person. Like, she's so stupid, she doesn't see, she doesn't understand and she would definitely kill herself. She's gonna do it. Am I crazy or is it something else? Farms all have their own peculiarities, but I believe that Jim Rothers' has to be the strangers I've encountered by far. I've lived across from Jim for the past five or so years, and he's always been a very quiet and introverted fellow. From what I know, he doesn't have a job, and he dedicates all of his time to tending to the massive assortments of animals on his farm. He doesn't even profit off of the farm, but God only knows how many animals there are. The man has to be insane. Even though I don't know the exact number, I know that the amount never changes. Even though he eats them, it's almost as soon as one goes, he has a brand new one ready to replace it immediately. I have no idea how the man does it. I have no idea how he upholds the well-being of that amount of animals all alone. That being said, he's also almost entirely off the grid, save for a few electronics. He sustains himself entirely off of the land and his animals. I kind of admire it. But aside from the farm's quirks, it's never really bothered me. Until the animals stopped moving. I didn't even care to point it out at first. And I didn't even think that something might be strange the day the first pig stood still. I simply didn't feel peculiar enough to comment on. And Jim had so many animals that he didn't notice it either. The pig stood at the edge of the fence, staring blankly. It didn't move, even when I went out to collect my mail. And it didn't move when the noisy garbage truck went by. I even waved my arms around in front of it in an attempt to rouse a reaction. But alas, I got none. The pig stood like a statue, unmoving, unblinking, unreactive. I started to get a pit in my stomach, telling me that something was wrong. But I ignored it 
and hopped into my car to drive to work. That night, I could barely sleep. I don't know exactly how to explain it, but something was up. Something felt off. The next morning, the pig by the fence had a friend. It was one of equal size and stature, and it stood about a yard away from the first. It stood still the same way. The first pig was still there, having now not moved for a full 24 hours. The sight was quite similar to that of a video game glitch, where the screen bugs and some of the mobiles freeze, only real. They were not dead, simply frozen. There was something odd about them, however, something that almost shouldn't be possible. I waited to express my concern until five of Jim's pigs were lined up at the edge of the fence, a new one frozen with the coming of each morning. Oh, hello there, neighbour, Jim greeted upon my knock. I proceeded to explain my concerns to him, but he seemed unfazed upon my vocal communication of it. The situation, oddly enough, didn't strike any of his nerves then, and it didn't even register when I dragged him to the edge of the fence to show him. Look, they're not moving, Jimmy. Is that normal? Jim placed his hands on his hips and shifted his weight to his left leg, tilting his head the same way as he fixated his gaze on the standstill swines. Eh, that's normal. They like that fence a whole mighty lot, Jim finally spoke, nonchalantly. What do you mean they like that fence a whole lot? They never stand there. And they certainly don't for 24 hours when they do. Jim looked at me like I was crazy. I'm telling you, neighbour, I know my pigs. I know when something's wrong with them, they're fine. I promise I'm not fooling you. Look, the flies are eating them alive because their tails are whacking them away. Jim stepped forward. I don't see anything wrong with them. They like that fence, he insisted. I'm telling you, Jimmy, there's something wrong with them. He shook his head and began to make his way inside the house. Since my mission proved to be futile, I returned home. I didn't sleep that night. I don't know what it was. I just couldn't. I felt a presence and I didn't feel safe. I couldn't allow myself to fall asleep. The next morning when I woke, there were seven pigs lined up at the fence. The five originals, plus two more. That was when I decided that on that very night, I would finally figure out what was going on. I would go over to Jim's yard in the middle of the night and examine the pigs. I couldn't stand to look at them anymore. I couldn't stand to look at their soulless, stiff bodies as they got eaten alive by insects. It was sickeningly fascinating. I couldn't wrap my mind around how it could be possible. And I wasn't sure that I wanted to be able to. So I waited in my house until sunset. I knew that Jim would be going to sleep right around then. He sleeps from dusk and wakes up right at dawn. I wanted to make sure that he didn't catch me in his yard. Not because I was doing anything he'd disapprove of. But simply because I wanted to avoid the awkward encounter. Just to be safe, I waited a few more hours until it was just about midnight. When the clock struck 12, I snuck around the side of my house and across the street to where the seven pigs stood at the fence. I approached them, my line of sight lit up only by the dull beam of my flashlight. They still didn't move. I hopped the fence to get a closer look, and they still didn't stir. All of the other animals were asleep in their pens, but these pigs remained. I shined my light around, and it was just then that I noticed something strange. One of the pigs had a wound from an insect that bore all the way through its outer layer of flesh. Only, instead of viscera and fascia, there was stuffing. I easily reached my hand out to touch the spot, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I don't know what I was thinking. I brushed off what I had just seen and moved to investigate further to see if the animal was even alive. I placed my hand to its chest and physically recoiled upon contact. It had a pulse and it was breathing shallowly. The last thing I was expecting was a pulse. I don't even know how it was possible. The pig was full of stuffing, but it also had a pulse. I felt sick. I continued my investigation with the other ones and I found the results to be the same. 
I was extremely curious though. It was sickening, but I wanted to figure out how it was possible. So, I stole one of Jim's pig. Don't ask how I did it, because it was difficult. But I managed to roll the swine to my house and into my garage without catching the attention of anything. After a bit of preparation, I placed the pig down on the floor and used my hunting knife to make a Y incision in its abdomen. Stuffing. It was all stuffing. Stuffing encased in a living, bleeding, almost breathing skin. It bled. The flesh bled into the white stuffing material, staining it crimson. I pulled some of the stuffing aside and to my horror, there was something pink and squishy, throbbing. I gagged and turned away upon seeing it. It was a beating heart with a pair of lungs, endlessly supplying only each other in what seemed to be a perpetual loop. At the top of the system, connected by a few nerves, was a piece of brain that I immediately recognised to be the medulla oblongata, regulator of involuntary responses. The thing that I now assume was key in keeping the system alive. I could hear the heart, and I could see it pulsating in the dim light of my garage. The whole thing seemed impossible. The animal's entire body was taxidermy, there were no bones, no other organs. All that remained was stuffing, a wire frame, and strangest and most disturbing of all, a working cardiovascular system. I was amazed, but also sickened. The fact that someone could taxidermy an animal while still keeping it alive was impressive, but also terrifying. As I couldn't imagine a reason why someone would, I couldn't imagine how it was possible. I called Jim. He answered the phone with a groggy, hello? Jim, I know it's late, but you've got to get over here. Why, what's going on? I, I paused. I don't know how to explain it. Meet me in my garage. I heard the phone hang up, and soon I heard a door squeak open and footsteps rustling through the grass. All right, Bobby, what's up? He asked. He had arrived in his bathrobe and slippers, not taking the time to dress before he came over. That was understandable. I walked him over to where I had the pig on the floor of my garage, and I attempted to explain without making myself a target for law enforcement. That's not my pig, he tuttered, his country drawl adding a musical twang to the word pig. What do you mean it's not your pig? I stole it from your yard. He placed his hands on his hips. I know my pigs, Bobby. That ain't one. I simply looked at him, baffled. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what was going on. Have fun with your science experiments, he shouted from the walkway as he made his way back across the street. I awoke the next morning and immediately went to the garage to check in on the status of the pig that I had stolen from my neighbour that now supposedly didn't belong to him. It was gone. The mess was gone too. All of the blood that had spewed upon my incision had been cleaned up, as had the entirety of the corpse. Well, it wasn't entirely gone as I had discovered when I went to check my mail. It was back in Jim's yard, repaired. Someone had closed my incision and mounted the pig back upright in the place it had initially stood, on the other side of my neighbour's fence. There was visible stitching, almost as if a person, a very skilled person, had done it. The line of seven pigs was now accompanied by a few chickens. The next few days went by as normal, I'd get up in the morning, see a new taxidermy animal in Jim's yard, attempt to rouse his suspicion, be ignored, go to work, repeat. Then the day came when the entire farm ceased to function, and my neighbour still didn't notice. It was about a week after the initial incident, and now every animal on the farm stood stiff and still, trapped in their own bodies as Jim continued to tend to them, as if nothing was wrong. Jim? I had caught him in the process of milking his cows. Hey, Bobby, he waved to me. You're a little dry today, aren't you, girl? He said to himself, patting the dairy's cow's side affectionately. I accidentally made eye contact with the animal, and my stomach surged with dread. I, I stopped myself. I had tried to convince Jim that something was wrong multiple times, but he didn't notice that anything had changed. He was a healthy man, and from my experience, he was pretty stable. 
But here he was, attempting to milk an animal that no longer had the ability to lactate. All right, this is getting really weird, I muttered to myself as I turned back to go home. I entered through my front door and ran to my kitchen, where the window above the sink offered me a clear view of Jim's yard. I took out my phone and dialed 911. The operator picked up and I did my best to explain the situation. Yeah, it's really strange. My neighbor, uh, I don't think he's okay. He doesn't even notice it. What's the address? I told the operator the address and she hung up. A few minutes later, the police arrived. I saw the flashing lights outside Jim's house and I saw him explaining with his hands. After a few minutes, the officers climbed back into their cars and drove away. I went over to his yard where he stood with his hands on his hips. Why'd you call the cops on me, Bobby? Jim, I'm really worried about you. This, this isn't normal. Your animals aren't alive. Yes, they are, Bobby. This is normal. This is all normal. They still have a pulse, don't they? Those words echoed through my head endlessly. And I will never forget Jim's eerie tone when he spoke them. What did the police say, I asked. They didn't see anything wrong, Bobby. They saw my dumb farm as it is. He put his hand on it is. They saw my damn farm as it is. I began to feel sick. I've got to get going. I've got a big meeting tomorrow and I need to rest. I'll see you later, Jim. You too, neighbor, he smiled. I waved and walked back to my house. And the minute I stepped inside the door, I broke to a sprint to the bathroom and regurgitated the contents of my breakfast. Jim's farm today had done something to me. It struck within me that kind of sense of dread that you can't swallow. Something was seriously wrong. Why did no one see what I saw? I woke up the next morning and looked out my window as I usually do, but something was out of place. Jim's animal was there, but he wasn't. I went over to check on him, and when I knocked on the door, no one answered. I tried the knob and it opened. Jim, I called out, no answer. I crept around the house, which was oddly empty. Everything was clean, not a thing was out of place. That was strange for Jim. Everything changed when I rounded the corner of his den and I found him staring blankly at the wall, frozen as his animals were, dead. I called the police and reported that I'd found a body. I stood on Jim's porch as they investigated the scene and got medics to take away the body. The coroner approached me from behind. You're not going to believe this, but your friend isn't dead. We're taking him to the hospital. What? He has a pulse. All I did was look the coroner in the eyes in shock before walking away. I had no words. That night, I packed my things and left to stay in a hotel in the city. The next morning, I planned to sell my house and get an apartment as soon as I could. I knew I couldn't stay there any longer when on my way out of town, I saw what seemed to be a person dressed in all black hop the fence to Jim's farm, carrying the stiffened version of him still dressed in a hospital gown back to its proper place. In high school, I was friends with this guy named Peter. Peter was in most of my classes, and we used to talk in class all the time. He was pretty cool. One thing that set Peter apart from the other kids was one thing. He wore an eye patch. The doc said I have a lazy eye, so it'll be Peter the pirate for the next few months, he chuckled. I never gave it a second thought. We continued being friends, and he became one of the most popular kids at our whole grade level. We used to hang out all the time. We'd go to parties, joke around, just do normal teenager things. He became quite notorious for his pranks on teachers and other students. Everything deteriorated on the night of Zach's party. Zach's parents were away for the weekend, so he invited me and all the rest of our little social group over for a small party. Nothing big, only we knew about it. Zach was a good kid. We were playing Truth or Dare, and it was Peter's turn. Dare, he chose. 
The boy snickered. Show us your lazy eye, Dad giggled. Nah, dude, it's embarrassing, he said sheepishly. That's the point, Dad laughed again. Something wasn't quite right. Is it the point of an eye patch for a lazy eye to cover the strong one? His lazy eye was the only one we saw. Peter should have known that. I turned to Peter and spoke up. Is it the lazy eye, the one that you use? The whole point is to strengthen it, I asked. Peter's face turned white. No, uh, it's a different kind of case, he muttered. So then show us, I want to see, Dad yelled. Peter stood up. I, uh, gotta go to the bathroom, he said awkwardly. As soon as he turned around, Dad jumped up and grabbed his eye patch. Under the eye patch was not an eye. It was a tentacle. What the hell is that? Dad shouted, jumping away. Peter turned his face to us with a look of shock, the tentacles still hanging out of his face. Then it started to crawl out of him as he fell on the floor. A creature of some sort. All I could describe it as like an octopus, but with four tentacles instead of eight. At the end of each tentacle was a mouth with razor sharp teeth. Peter collapsed to the ground unconscious. The creature started to make its way towards Dan, who was now screaming at the top of his lungs. What is that? What the hell? What is that thing? He whimpered as he backed away from it. Dan continued to panic as the creature started to climb up his legs, making its way towards his face. Get that thing off of him, I yelled. Zack grabbed a baseball bat and started to hit the thing, but it was no use. We watched in shock as the creature's tentacle made its way towards Dan's left eye. Dan was crying as Zack and I frantically tried to get the creature off of him. Please get it off me, get it off. Dad's screams echoed through the house as the creature's teeth latched onto his eyeball and pulled it straight out of the socket. I'll never forget the image. The nerves and viscera coming out of his head along with the eye as the monster ate it. Dad's screams were cut short when the creature began crawling into his eye socket and it disappeared into him, all except for the tentacle. Dan's face went blank and he stiffly walked over to where Peter's eye patch was on the floor, he picked it up, put it on and walked out the door. Zach and I stood there, dumbfounded and in shock at what we had just witnessed. Then I remember Peter. Zach and I turned around and knelt on the floor next to Peter, trying to wake him up. Peter, Peter, wake up. His eyelashes fluttered as he slowly came to. Who, who are you guys, he groaned. Zach and I exchanged a glance. And why, why can't I? Where's my eye? He said in a panicked tone, copying his hand over the empty socket. When I was little, my cousins lived in this huge Victorian mansion. The kind that had secret passengers and hidden rooms that you'd likely inherit from a dead great-grandparent. The estate was located in the middle of a desolate forest with a total township population of 20 people. And every summer, my brother Jacob and I would be sent to stay with our cousins for the duration of the season. Andrew was my age, one year older than Jacob, and Naomi was two years my elder. Andrew and Naomi were our best friends. Every summer, we'd be have a blast playing in the forest and coming up with our own games to keep ourselves occupied. The house in particular had more secret passengers and rooms than one could even begin to imagine. And Naomi knew them all like the back of her hand. Hey Ava, guess where I am? Her voice emanated throughout our shared bedroom, always after bedtime. Where would she be this time? The wall? The ceiling? All I knew is that it would never be where I expected. I peeked up from the book I was reading. I don't know, where are you? I asked. She giggled from her hiding spot before popping out of the storage chest at the foot of her bed. Naomi, how did you get in there? I asked excitedly. She climbed out of the chest and gestured for me to come over. Look, she said, as she pointed to a small trapdoor on the floor. 
the chest was bottomless, allowing for her to the door to be usable. I peeked into the chest with wide eyes, excited by the new secret passageway. I found the door in the bathroom closet, she said excitedly, so I followed it, and it led here. Cool, I exclaimed. A troublemaker smirk appeared across Naomi's face. You want to go scare the boys, she asked, through a giggle. Yeah, I said. She put a finger to her lips and hushed me as she pried up the panelling on the wall and led me into another crawl space. As soon as I stepped into the crawl space, I started to feel extremely uneasy. My body was trying to tell me that I shouldn't be there. We repressed our giggles as we crawled through the walls, eventually ending up in the closet of the bedroom that Andrew and Jacob were using. Boo! Naomi shouted as she threw open the closet door and jumped into the bedroom. Both boys screamed in fear, but all of us began laughing once they realised it was just us. Another secret passageway, Naomi? Andrew asked. Yeah, she said excitedly. How do you keep finding them? Jacob asked. Naomi shrugged. I don't know, she replied. Don't you feel scared when exploring? I asked her. Nah, she said. Oh. Of course, with all the house's secrets, our favourite game was hide and seek. We'd play hide and seek whenever we got the chance to, and Naomi always won. Even if I found a spot that I was sure she wouldn't find, she always found it. Sometimes a single game would last hours, simply because no one could find Naomi. When we did find her, it was always in a secret passage or room that no one had seen before. The last time we played was the summer of 99. I was eight and Naomi was ten. We were staying up past our bedtime to play another round of hide and seek, and I was the seeker. I walked around the house and spare for the occasional four-ball creak. It was quiet. Naomi and Andrew's parents were in their living room watching TV, and Jacob, Andrew and Naomi were hiding. The house was creepy at night, with dim lighting and an antique style to the furnishing. As an eight-year-old, I couldn't help but be creeped out. It always gave me a small twinge of paranoia, as if something was living in the house besides us. I remember creeping around the house until I found Jacob and Andrew. They were both in the mansion's dining hall, Andrew under the table and Jacob in one of the many cabinets that lined the walls. Did you find Naomi yet? Andrew asked me. I said no, and both boys joined me to help her. Only, we never did. We stayed up searching until the clock read 2am before we finally decided to forfeit. Okay, Naomi, you win, I yelled out. No answer. I walked around the house yelling for her, but I never got an answer. Which was weird, because we usually ended up forfeiting to her and she would answer our calls when we did. After searching every last corner of the house, we couldn't find Naomi. Maybe she went outside. She wouldn't. She's afraid of the woods. Maybe she found the new crawl space. False. She would have still answered our shouts. We didn't want to bother her parents over a game, so we decided to just go to bed, thinking maybe she'd show herself in the morning. When breakfast was served, Naomi still didn't show up. Where's Naomi? My aunt asked, glancing towards the plate she'd set out for her. I don't know, I said. Is she still sleeping? No. She wasn't even in a room last night. We played hide and seek and she never came out of a hiding spot, I said. A statement sent my aunt into a panic and she went to fetch my uncle. They searched for her all day, to no avail. It got to the point where they called the police to issue a missing person report. The police searched the house and they didn't find her. What they did find though was a new passageway behind a bookshelf in the library. A dark tunnel. No one knew where it led, but it looked like it had been used recently. As I looked into it, I felt a feeling of dread, as if something was telling me to get away. For the next few days, Andrew, Jacob and I attempted a lot of eavesdropping, failing every time to make sense of the hushed whispers we heard among the adults. My aunt and uncle, along with Andrew, ended up selling that house and moving. My brother and I never spent another summer with them. I never found out what happened to her, and all of my family members just acted confused when I bring her up. All I know 
is that she must have found a pretty damn good hiding spot because no one has seen her in 20 years. I've been having various things happen in my house over the years. I live and work in a small rural town. Some of the local kids told my stepdaughters the previous owner died in the hallway in front of our front bathroom. But speaking with the EMTs at work, she was actually dead on the bed. The first instance I can think of was when I was out of time with my wife and youngest stepdaughter. The oldest stepdaughter was home alone and texted me asking who her mom was with me because she had just heard her mom calling her into the living room. We just blew it off as her being scared since she was alone. A few weeks later, my wife, who worked nights, called me at work, freaked out. She said she heard kids laughing in the kitchen and she woke up to it. Thinking the kids were skipping school, she went into the kitchen, only to find it empty. The first event that really freaked me out was one morning after my wife came home from work. I decided to stay in bed with her and sleep in a little. My youngest stepdaughter had a habit of barely opening the door and going Psst, to get my attention without waking her mom. I swear I heard that, but didn't want to open my eyes, and I tried mumble whispering back. I swear I heard her footsteps come up to my bed and had her face over mine, like I could feel there above my face talking to me. I kept trying to mumble back to let me sleep, and then I realised I couldn't understand any of the words, and it didn't sound like my stepdaughter's voice. I then snapped awake and realised my wife was on her side, facing away from me, and no one else was in the room. There have been a few similar things happen where I would hear whispers of a female trying to talk to me. There was a funny one that happened, but I can blame it on the house shifting in the wind. The master bedroom has a door to the backyard in it, one night, while home alone, I heard scratching in the attic. It turned out to be a raccoon. I was laying there in the bed and the dog didn't seem to notice. So me being funny said, hey ghost, listen to this. I let out a big fart and then the door blew open. I was terrified and amused at the same time. I told my wife that I thought the ghost would be gone for a while because I grossed her out and she ran out the back door. It wasn't long after that. I found out the old woman had died in the bed. Shortly after that, we got rid of that bed and got a new one. Still have odd occurrences though. Most other things are the common seeing shadows out of the corner of your eyes move and odd lights flickering and things like that. Has anyone come across the Enochian calls? And if so, how are they introduced to you? This is a shorter version of how I was introduced to them. So one day in 2008, after my shitty studio apartment got broken into but nothing was taken, two websites mysteriously appeared as bookmarked sites on my computer. One was the Enochian cause, and the other was a link to the US Navy. Now that Navy thing was strange, as I had recently been re-evaluated by the VA for benefits. Now you don't have to believe me, but I had never heard the word Enochian before that website showed up on the computer. What struck me initially was that in the beginning before the course, there was a message that seemed to be aimed at me, or rather those like me. But the gist of it to me was not to get involved in the affairs of man, because they would weed themselves out. Also, to not stay in any one place for too long. After that, I read the call for the first time. The short of the calls is this. Basically, the best way I could describe it is that it's like a telephone book. Reciting the calls is like dialing, and then at the end you insert the name you want. Sort of like how you would dial an extension. After I got the bookmark, I did some research and found it was a type of magic. Most commonly known because of its use by one Alistair Crowley. However, what I think people don't understand is that these calls must be pronounced correctly for things to happen. Otherwise you could be saying abracadabra for half an hour and still be where you were when you started. Anyways, I became obsessed with learning everything I could about Enochian 
and I found someone who in their forward seemed to have knowledge of things and an understanding of other things. They had also prepared a list with how to properly vocalise the words, giving examples of when something should sound like the A in bar, far or car, or when it should sound like the A in rate, hate or bait. So when I recited the calls using the ways written, all sorts of strange shit started happening. So impressed was I that even though I had the information I need, thanks to the computer, I still tracked down a copy of this person's book, which I still have to this day. In 2010, something happened that made me completely stop using the calls. So for me, it takes about 30 minutes to recite the calls. This particular time, I chose a random name to insert at the end. And then, at the end, it happened. A voice from nowhere and yet seemingly everywhere spoke. Just the two words. Ma, eh. But in those two words, I understood what power there was in the voice. When I heard those two words, my ears stank like nothing I'd ever felt before. Understood that this was a time in my life where I thought I had a decent grasp on supernatural shit. It was in those words I understood two things. The first was why the Lord doesn't speak to man. The vessel, or to put it more simply, the body, could not withstand it. The second was that even though that wills the vessel that is typing these words is not like other men's, the difference between spirits and souls. That doesn't change the fact that the vessels are the same, and as such, just as limited in certain aspects to any other. When I heard those words, it was like my ears tried to close the hole on its on. The pain was extreme and unexpected. Shaken to my core, I stopped reciting the cause. But the pain is not why I would tell people not to investigate or perform the cause. It's because one must understand what it is they are saying in these calls. One must understand that they are calling on spirits to help them, not as an individual, but as a fellow servant of the Lord. If one were to review the calls, I would urge them to see how many times that particular phrase is used. Now, unlike this world where faith cannot be seen, in that world, the truth of a person is clearly visible. And that's where shit goes real bad, real fucking quick. Mankind is not loved by all spirits. It's only the desire to be near the Lord that keeps them from jumping mad shit. So imagine what would happen if something you didn't like in the first place was found to not serve the Lord as they had claimed when they asked you to help them. The Lord doesn't always intervene on man's behalf. That's why I would advise against dabbling in Enochian. I moved away from my home state almost a year ago. Between then and now, I've gone back to visit once, and I stayed where my sister, Em, was staying at the time. I got involved with a friend, John, years prior. Em had been staying with him as per my recommendation. The rent was cheap, and she was allowed to do what she wanted. At this point in my life, I had just become religious. And I also th- felt as though my spiritual senses had become more refined after a baptism. I led my life with logic, so naturally, I was not a believer of the paranormal before this. It started out small. Whenever I was home, I'd hear knocking on the wall that separated my room from my sister's. They started soft, but would get louder as my stay unfolded. One night, they were loud enough to make me think someone was knocking at the door all the way downstairs. When I went to answer, Nobody was there. I usually chalked this up to ding-dong ditches or someone being impatient. I began hearing shuffling or thumping in her room as well. There was a cat that enjoyed getting into her room, so after plenty of these noises, I decided to block off the door with something heavy. It didn't latch shut. As I was home alone again going into the night, I heard more noises and got up to see if the cat somehow got into the room. The barricade I had placed was not moved, and the door was tightly shut. One night, as I lay to sleep, I heard another loud knock. This time, it was in a very common rhythm that I heard all over the place. 
The beat was often used as a form of communication or as an attention getter for most people. There's usually a string of them, then a pause, waiting for the last two beats from the recipient of the first ones. This would tell someone you're there in response. I thought it was the door, but nobody was there. I came back upstairs to hear a loud thud come from my sister's room again. Nothing was in there, Cat was asleep. One day, when John wasn't working, I came out of my room to speak to him. I couldn't find him anywhere, so I checked my sister's room and thought I saw his forearm wrapped around a giant teddy bear on her bed. The teddy bear blocked the rest of his body. His arms were pale with scars and veins, very easy to recognize for me. I decided to let him sleep. Later, I heard the door open and close. He had just come in from shopping. I asked him why he was sleeping on my sister's bed instead of the couch, and he gave me a strange look, assuring me he had never done that before. He had gone shopping before I woke up that morning and hadn't been home since. I went for a night walk, which I love, and later came back and hung out with John. He asked me if I knocked on the door to play a joke on him. He demonstrated the same beat that I had heard while I was alone, but I never told him about the knocking. Another day, he asked me why I stared at him through my sister's window when he was parked outside. He described me wearing a black bra and no top. But I didn't even pack a black bra with me. Any bras I did have were light in colour. Later, he told me of a figure hanging onto the side of a truck that was driving down the road next to the house. It was apparently adorned in black cloth and he couldn't see any feet on it. It was hooded and the cloth looked like silky see-through material. He said after the truck passed by a telephone pole, the figure had disappeared. After each occurrence in the home, we looked for intruders, but never found any. Going into that room alone gave me a strong sense of dread and threat at times, to the point where I'd lose focus and forget what I went into the room for. My sister was rarely ever there. The house was previously a drug house. Ever since, I've been experiencing things going missing. Putrid smells, cold gusts, noises, and even felt as though I was bitten on my stomach as I was trying to sleep. I feel as though someone is standing in my peripherals staring at me. I feel their eyes, but when I look, there's nobody there. Does anyone have advice, information, theories as to what's going on? I can't explain many of the things that went on, and I was bitten on the stomach last night. I'm guessing uncomfortable. So this happened a little over 10 years ago for me, but I still think about it occasionally. I wanted to share my experience of being at a concentration camp in Germany in 2011. So back in June of 2011, me and 20 other students from my high school got to travel from the US to Germany and study in Berlin for a month. The trip was fantastic, but a particular event stood out to me. During the trip, we were taken to visit Sachsenhausen concentration camp. The mood during the trip, as you would expect, was grim. It was almost as if there was a blanket of sadness cast over us when we stepped through the gates. Seeing the courtyard, the mess hall, the work areas, it was all a bit overwhelming. During the visit, we sat in the bunks area, not actually on the bunks, they were behind a glass wall. We sat on benches made many years later. I remember sitting there looking down at the table, thinking about my day, when I felt an arm brush by my side. I didn't think anything of it, but I felt it again on my other side, and again, and again, and again. Finally, I looked up to see who was bumping into me, and to my shock, no one was there. No one to my left or right. I was alone at the table. Needless to say, I got up and left in a hurry. This was my first experience with anything paranormal. I'm not gonna say I necessarily believe in ghosts, but I've always gone back to that day in my head and thought, just maybe, there is something out there. My girlfriend of over a year now, has never mentioned anything like this or related to paranormal activity. Last night while on the phone, she left to go get a drink. 
when I had heard the sound of heavy breathing and what sounded like someone smacking their lips. I paid it no mind as she has a dog and two cats. So when she returned, I asked what animal she was sleeping with. She had told me that they weren't there with her. And after talking a bit, she said it was the demon she had been seeing. I played it off as a joke, knowing what we like to make jokes to light and tension. But she was serious and promised me it wasn't a joke. She said for the last few weeks, she's seen a shadowy figure walking around her room, but it doesn't look human. She stated that she had heard stories from it and it never sounded like real words, just random things. Obviously freaked out and concerned, I was asking what was happening and if she was okay and whatnot. She then said she could see it currently, but said she wasn't supposed to tell me about her, whatever was in her room. She then went silent and kept talking about it and saying every time she would blink, it would get closer. Concerned for her, I suggested she turn the light on as I know people usually react better with lights on. So she called out for her Alexa and did so. She said it disappeared and that she was feeling better now and just wanted to head to sleep. She mentioned that whatever she would see, this figure that turning the lights on would make it leave her. So her plan was to turn the lights back off and head to bed. But as she did so, I heard her trembling and repeatedly keep commanding her Alexa to turn the lights back on over and over and the Alexa wasn't working. She eventually got the lights on and was freaked out but wouldn't talk about it. Just played it off and tried to sleep. I didn't argue or pressure her into talking and just said okay and let her know I was there and she soon fell asleep. But does anyone know what we're dealing with or what's going on? I was eight years old when we first moved into the house on the edge of the forest. My parents had their doubts about buying a house with a backyard bordered by forest. They had concerns about wild animals getting into our bins or hunting our dogs. And were worried one of us might go too far into the trees and get lost. But it was cheap. My dad liked the seclusion. My mom loved the house itself. And my siblings and I were excited about playing in the backyard and exploring the forest. Our first sign something wasn't right was that our dogs were absolutely terrified of the forest. They never went into the forest for any reason. If a toy they'd been playing with found its way past the tree line, they'd refuse to retrieve it. And when one of us went in, they would pace anxiously until we returned. On occasion, we'd notice the dogs staring at a spot in the forest in obvious distress, sometimes growling or barking, but we could never see anything there. My brother once carried one of the dogs into the trees to show her there was nothing scary about it, but she wriggled out of his grip and sprinted into the house in a panic. If we were in the backyard when it was getting dark, we sometimes heard noise like someone was walking through the forest, sticks crunching underfoot, branches being pushed aside. If we called out, there was no response. But if we shined a flashlight around, we would occasionally catch a glimpse for just a split second of something that we could swear looked like a person walking around in the dark. My parents quickly banned us from entering the forest at all after dark. And even during the day, we weren't allowed to go out of sight of the house. My sister's bedroom window looked out at the backyard and the forest beyond. And she remembers looking out her window one night and seeing a shadowy figure standing right at the edge of the backyard. She says there was something wrong with it. Like it wasn't quite standing on the ground and it was a little too tall to be a person, and it was sort of distorted. And she was convinced it was staring at her. She called for our dad, saying there was a man in the yard staring through a window. And when he ran outside to chase off whoever it was, she continued to watch the figure. It didn't move away, but when the lights from our dad's flashlight passed over it, it suddenly just wasn't there anymore. We regularly heard knocking at the back door at night with no one there. Our parents thought it was teenagers playing pranks and stopped bothering even opening the door until one rainy night when the knocking was persistent and agitated. My mom pointed out there might be someone needing shelter from the heavy rain outside. But when she opened the door, not only was there no one there, but there were no wet footprints on the porch. The knocking continued the whole time we lived there. It would happen several times in the span of a few weeks, then stop for months and then start up again. 
My parents eventually installed a security camera and there was never anyone at the door. The camera wasn't all useless though. About three years into living there, my brother started having night terrors and sleepwalking. When he went sleepwalking, he would always go out to the back door and start walking towards the forest. My mom, being a light sleeper, would hear the door open and would run out to get him before he made it into the forest. After the third or fourth time it happened, my brother asked to see the camera footage because he wanted to see how he looked when sleepwalking. I guess thinking it'd look funny. The footage showed him walking out onto the porch, then pausing as if listening to something and shaking his head, then reluctantly walking forward as if being pulled or forcefully guided by something. One evening, my dad was in the backyard and he heard my sister calling him from the forest, seemingly in distress. Thinking she'd gone exploring in the forest and fallen over and hurt herself, he ran in and started calling to her, but quickly realized it was too dark to see her and he couldn't pinpoint where her voice was coming from. He told her to wait where she was while he grabbed a flashlight. When he ran back into the house for the flashlight, he saw my sister inside, safe and completely unconcerned. At the time, my dad hadn't told us about hearing my sister's voice in the forest. So when I heard my mom's voice coming from the forest months later, while I was outside with the dogs one evening, I didn't question it, despite the fact I'd seen my mom inside recently and hadn't noticed her walk past me. My mom was calling for me, saying she'd gotten her sweater caught in some branches and needed me to come in and help her. As I walked in, the dog started barking, alerting my dad, who saw me through the window wandering into the forest. He came outside and called to me, and I said I was just helping mom. He yelled back that mom was inside and I needed to run back to the house as fast as I could, which I did. After this, my parents had a fence built around the backyard and started looking for a new place. In the time between the fence being built and us moving out, it got way worse. We'd hear knocking at the door more regularly, as well as tapping on the windows, as if someone was walking the perimeter of the house and trying every window. We would often hear scratching and scraping sounds on the fence and voices beyond it. My brother's night terrors got more frequent, and one night, my mom didn't hear the door open when he went sleepwalking, and he woke up standing at the fence, staring into the forest, with the dogs barking at him. The last morning we spent there, less than four years after we moved in, we woke up to find the back door fully open and the security camera footage showed it slowly swing open on its own. Since moving out, my brother's sleepwalking has stopped, though he still gets night terrors and he suffers from pretty severe anxiety. A few nights ago, he called me out of the blue and after a bit of small talk, he asked me if I think the door being opened that final night means whatever was out there finally got in. He was trying to make light of it, saying he was getting into the spirit of Halloween, joking about how maybe we should all get exercise just in case something latched onto us all those years ago. But I think he's deeply bothered by everything that happened. I know I still am a little. I get nervous around dark wooded areas. I don't know what I think was out there, in the forest beyond our house at night, but I get the feeling that given the chance, it would have swallowed us whole. So for context, I live in Melbourne, Australia, and on the suburbs outside my city, there's a prison called HM Prison Pentridge that functioned up until the 80s. It's most famed for being the place where Ned Kelly was hanged and buried, but most of the original building has been lost to housing developments. The place is abandoned and only accessible by ghost tours, as the prison is famed for being ridden with paranormal activity, with the earliest paranormal sightings occurring in 1919. Early this year, I went on a ghost tour through the D division and we were on the ground floor and I was looking towards the back wall. The wall was around 15 meters away and the closest cell towards the back belonged to a serial killer named Mark, nicknamed Chopper, Red. He's most notorious for cutting off his ears while he was in prison. He claimed to have killed 19 people, but he was never charged with murder. The specific cell he stayed in for the majority of his 25 year sentence was behind a gate where they kept prisoners. He'd be bullied and beaten by other prisoners, such as rapists and paedophiles. 
but Chopper had a good reputation among the guards, who would often let him out of his cell and into the greater caged off area. He was released from prison and became a novelist and author of children's books. He died of liver cancer in 2013 as a free man, but some people say his spirit is still trapped in Pentridge. So anyway, the guide was talking, but I was looking up towards the back wall where Chopper's cell was, and I see a shadowy black figure of a man leaning against the brick wall, with his arms folded and one foot up against the wall. Then, when we were going to move on, the figure pushes itself off the wall, stumbles a little, I blink, and it's gone. I couldn't stop thinking about it on the drive home. <laughs>